Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining us here um, online. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director for the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. We are a uh, small nonprofit doing great big things out of Stonington, Maine. And I'm sure many of you have uh, uh, seen our work before and been on previous webinars. This is our fourth one for this year. We call them our Lunch and Learns. Normally you'd be in this great conference room that we have right on the harbor, but because of the pandemic, many of our programs and a lot of your life experiences are turning to Zoom in this kind of uh, format. So here we are online. These have worked out quite quite well for us uh, all summer long, very popular, and we've had uh, people from all over the place uh, joining us for these um, hour-long seminars. <clears throat> our mission at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries is to sustain commercial fishing and the communities that depend on it in this part of, of Maine and elsewhere. Uh, we do that through what we organize as collaborative research, collaborative management, and collaborative education. And today we're going to hear um, about uh, some of our work going on in the collaborative research space, a uh, partnership project that's been going on for several years that Pat will tell you more about um, with the University of Maine and the Nature Conservancy and other um, supporters that have been part of this project for quite some time. Um, so welcome. Uh, we're going to hear from Robin Lanier, the graduate student who you see on, on the, your screen first, and then Pat Shepard, our collaborative research uh, specialist from our center, will go second, and we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion later on. You can participate in the Q&A in a couple of ways. There's the chat feature uh, on your screen, as well as a Q&A feature, and I will keep uh, the participant list in front of me um, later in the webinar so that you can raise your hand if you like and I can uh, call on you. And I think you can actually ask your question verbally. Is that right, Pat, if, if I allow them? Yeah. So we'll see how all that goes. But um, again, thanks for joining us and I'll hand it over to Pat and Robin. All right, thank you, Paul. So I'll be going first. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Robin Lanier. I'm towards the end of my second year as a PhD student at the University of Maine. Um, and I was actually initially hired on specifically to work um, on this collaborative survey called the Eastern Gulf of Maine Sentinel Survey, um, which is a collaboration between the university, MCCF, and with local fishermen, um, which is going to be kind of the the main topic of today is how their contributions have, you know, really shaped this survey. So I'm going to take more of kind of a specific look at how fishermen are involved in this particular survey, and then Pat's going to take kind of more of a broad view of some of the different things that MCCF does, as well as just kind of like, you know, general, <laughs> uh, you know, best practices for when working um, with the fishing community. So I will begin, Pat, if you can move to the next slide. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm just going to talk about design first to explain kind of how our survey operates um, and how it's kind of come together over the years. So the Sentinel survey is targeting four ground fish species, which ground fish really just means fish that live near the bottom. There are many, many ground fish species, but we're particularly targeting Atlantic cod, white hake, cusk, and Atlantic halibut. So if you take a look um, at this graph here, you can, you can see on the map that there are three different colors of stations, which represent three different types of stations um, that we use on the survey which the type of station is dependent upon the gear used and the depth at which that station exists. So um, the red is the inshore jig. So we use jigs, um, just poles with three hooks and kind of a shiny weight at the bottom that bounces along and kind of entices fish that way to, to bite on. Um, so those red ones are the most inshore in what we call strata zero, um, which is like up to around 50 meters. Um, and then the yellow stations are offshore jigging stations, um, still just jig, no long line at those stations, but those are divided into stratas one, two, and three. So there are four stations in each of those strata. And then the blue stations, of course, are where we use both long lining and jigging gear. Um, and those are also split into the three strata, kind of like with the offshore jig stations. Um, 
But how we, we came up with this idea for a stratified, you know, random design in which it's stratified by depth actually came from our first two pilot years of the survey in which fishermen were basically just asked to go out and target these species. And then based on what we learned about where we found them, we found that there are some, you know, really real relationships between where you can find these species and the depth. And so that's why we try to make sure that we cover kind of all depths um, so that we're not biased towards one or the other because cod tend to prefer more shallow regions while some of these other species um, we find more often offshore. So we want to make sure we're not biasing our data in that way. Um, but that was that all came from information that fishermen brought us essentially by using their knowledge um, to target these species. And in addition, um, when we first developed this stratified random design. It was actually only longline sites. Um, but some fishermen made comments that, because we weren't really catching very many cod, um, that, that cod are much more likely to kind of go for something like a jig. And so by adding that jigging component, um, we, can, we can much better target that particular species. Um, and we still find that to this day, those red inshore jigging stations are where we find the majority of cod. Um, so that was a pretty invaluable um, addition to this survey, at least concerning um, how we can best target um, all species. Next slide, please. And so that was basically, you know, mostly about how fishermen have kind of contributed to the design itself. Um, but fishermen, you know, participate and, you know, more than just driving the boat on the survey. Um, every year we have these stations called Fisherman's Choice Stations. So in addition to all of those random stations I just chose, or I just showed you, fishermen can choose where they want to target cod um, within that area, which really allows fishermen to be fishermen. I mean, you know, the, the random stations, while they're obviously chosen for a reason, you know, why we stratify them by depth, um, this really gives them a chance to use their knowledge, use their curiosity, and gives us really valuable information about, you know, where kind of these hotspots are um, that otherwise our random stations can't really identify. Um, and so, so each year fishermen are allowed to, to choose their spots. It's really exciting um, in the last few years because we've had, I think over six fishermen at least participate each year. So there's a lot of kind of different reasons why they might choose a spot, whether it's curiosity, whether it's, you know, historic fishing grounds back in the day when, you know, ground fishing was big with gill nets, whether it was, you know, maybe they, saw a big cod there like in their lobster traps a couple weeks ago, whatever it is, there are all these different reasons. Um, and it's, it's exciting to kind of get to see them in their element. <laughs> Next slide, please. So another way that fishermen participate, which I think is really important, um, is, I mean, they come to us with, you know, questions and ideas all the time of like, well, have you looked at this? Like, have you analyzed this? Have you found any relationship between you know, catching the tide or whatever, but every once in a while, like something gets brought up that makes a really big impact on our survey. And this gillnet validation study is one of those things. So one concern that comes up a lot in surveys is whether the gear that you're using is actually catching what's there. It's like the age old question, because if you're not actually catching what's there, how can you really use your results in any sort of meaningful way? And historically, um, groundfish have not been caught with hook gear like long line and jigs. And so a lot of fishermen were concerned that maybe we're missing fish that are there purely because our gear just isn't capable of catching it. So we actually implemented this gillnet validation study. So basically we're comparing our gear to what a 50 fathom gillnet looking for an hour can catch. Because if we can find that there are differences between what survey gear and gillnet gear can catch, that can give us some pretty important information about what that might mean um, for what our analyses <laughs> are saying. So um, the, the fishermen that you see in this photo um, are some of the guys that came up with the idea that helped us design the gillnets because um, we use three different mesh sizes because gill nets, if the mesh size is too big, little fish are going to swim through. <laughs> um, if it's too small, bigger fish aren't going to be able to get trapped. So you have to kind of have different mesh sizes to allow for a range of sizes to be caught. Um, 
And so they helped us put it together. It was really exciting because it was when I first joined the project. So coming into this like very collaborative <laughs> experience where these fishermen were really kind of leading this whole idea. And I think that it, it was really great to see the scientists and, and MCCF and, and the fishermen all working together on something that's really important. Um, Cause I think one, one big barrier between scientists and fishermen is that survey results don't necessarily match up to what they think it should be and something like this that's validating or you know trying to validate what the survey is doing is so important in in kind of making sure that we feel confident in our results um and so this was a, a really great way um that's ongoing we started the gilnet validation study last year we're doing it this year um we'll very likely be continuing it on to next year so results <laughs> to come <laughs> um but yeah that's a pretty exciting addition and then, so from all of this data um, that we're gathering using that random design, using the fisherman knowledge, um, I just wanted to comment a little bit on what we do with it. <laughs> so this is a fairly small scale survey. So we're not trying to guess like how many fish are in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's beyond our scope, it's beyond our understanding, but what we do wanna try to figure out is whether, you know, how are the populations changing? Are they declining? Are they, you know, increasing? And so by coming up with these things called abundance indices, which is um, the figure that you see in the top left. So they're kind of like arbitrary numbers that by themselves don't really make sense. But when you compare them to past years, you can kind of see how at least our perception of their populations are, are changing. And so we did see kind of a, a market increase last year, which was exciting. Um, because there appeared to be a, a pretty big decrease from 2017 to 2018. Um, so that was pretty, pretty hopeful information. Um, and so we create these for all of the types of gear um, for the different species, not just for cod. I just put cod up here at the moment. Um, and then the figure that you see to the right and is, is an example of one of our kind of habitat suitability analyses. So beyond just B temp, which is bottom temperature, you can also see we have sea surface temperature here. Um, we also look at how suitable um, things like depth and sediment type are. And so we can see that they kind of prefer like a medium bottom temp, at least over the range that we're sampling, um, and a little bit cooler uh, surface temperatures if they can, if they can find it. Um, and in addition to those kind of analyses that we run, we take a lot of biological samples from the field and send them to people. So this is another way, another portion of the collaboration is that after all of these different groups have gotten together to do the survey, the data goes out to a whole bunch of different people. So photos like this, uh, it's called a morphometric photo being used by Graham Sherwood at GMRI um, to try to determine whether there are just like obvious physical differences that can be um, sussed out between cod in different parts of the Gulf of Maine. Um, otoliths, uh, which if you guys don't know what those are, they're these little ear bones inside of a fish, um, which can be used to age them. So it's kind of like rings on a tree. You can count the rings and, and figure out how old they are. Um, and then muscle tissue, uh, which we have taken muscle tissue, not just from cod, um, but from many of the species that we catch on our survey. That tells us really interesting information about what the fish has been eating kind of in a general sense, like over a long period of time. Um, and we've gotten some of that information analyzed and I'm, I'm really excited to see the official results because I think they're gonna say some pretty interesting things about what's happening with, with the fish in this area. Um, some examples, uh, which is part of my PhD, because I'm really interested in, in what cod are eating um, and how that differs you know, over time and space. Um, and also fin clips, which are the genetic information that we get from a fish, um, which have been used by several different organizations over the years, um, but most recently have gone to, to UNH and DFO. So it's pretty exciting that our, like, our little survey, our little collaborative survey, you know, can have kind of far reaching um, implications because of, of where all of this data is going. So I will pass this off to Pat.
I suppose I should unmute myself before I start talking. There we go. Um, hi, uh, I'm Pat Shepard. I am the Collaborative Research Specialist at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And um, I uh, have worked on the Sentinel Survey for, well, I've worked for Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries for about eight years, and I've worked on the Sentinel Survey for uh, six of those eight years. Um, and so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a step back and talk about collaborative research uh, sort of from a 30,000 foot view and, um, uh, and describe some of the best practices that, uh, that we've found and that I found to be effective at uh, sort of leading a collaborative effort and, and, um, uh, and sort of joining all of these uh, different people together in a collaborative research project setting. Um, so um, I stuck about a dozen things that I could think of off the top of my head onto a list uh, of, of things that I, I see as uh, sort of the, the important elements of true collaboration between uh, stakeholders that are involved in a collaborative research project. Well, whether it's our Sentinel survey or the alewife work that we do. Um, and uh, I'm gonna tick down through these and I've got some photos and some stories to share about each of them. So I'm not going to go through them right now, but I'll go through them sort of one by one. The first and foremost thing that, um, that I think is really important in a collaborative research study is to start with the guys that are out there. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I really like this photo. It sort of speaks, um, it speaks a lot to me because um, uh, it, it, it really uh, shows an example of, of the type of guys that we work with and the fact that they're out there every day. Um, this is Matt Perez. Uh, we were in this photo, we were steaming from one site to another and it took us about 40 minutes, um, I think to steam from one of those little blue boxes that Robin showed you earlier to another. And he set the autopilot and he stood up on his uh, washboard and kind of leaned up against the, the A-frame there. And he, I think he stood there for the entire 40 minute steam from one site to another. And I can only imagine what was sort of going through his head while he was standing up there, just kind of scanning the horizon. Um, you know, he was probably thinking about, you know, where he was going to fish when he got to that spot. He was probably thinking about um, what he had heard from some of the old timers that used to fish there, um, how to read the tide, how to set the gear. Um, maybe he was thinking about what he was going to have for dinner that night. I have no idea. But um, sort of part of the beginning of this whole process is to crack into a fisherman's head and um, and find out, you know, sort of what they've been thinking about what the environment around them is telling them. Um, I had uh, a, a unique experience uh, just recently fishing with a commercial pogey saner out of Stonington. And uh, I spent a couple of days with him and uh, I learned more about pogies in two days than I, I ever knew in my life. Um, you know, he, he was telling me that when you set the pogey saying you want to set it so that the sane ends up in between the school of fish and the sun. And I asked him why. And he said, well, when, when fish spook, when pogies spook, they'll spook toward the sun. And so when you set the seine, you want to set it so that the seine is in between the fish and the sun, because when they swim toward the sun, they can see the shadows coming at them and they can avoid predators. And it just kind of like small examples like that just kind of blow your mind that, um, you know, people that are out there every day are reading what's going on in the environment around them because they're out there every day. Um, you know, I, um, I've been on the water all my life. I've, I've, um, I've been running boats um, a little bit, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not the person that's standing on the deck of that boat every day. So uh, for somebody like Matt Perez, who turns the key every single morning and spends his life on the ocean, that vessel and everything underneath it becomes a, an extension of his body essentially, and, and that's what we're tapping into when we start a project like this. Um, one of the really neat things that we started last year was to get all of the fishermen that were involved in the project onto the same message thread. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a neat thing that, uh, that we had never really thought of before, but what it kind of turned into was really cool. These uh, fishermen and uh, myself and Robin and a couple of other people at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries were all on this same message thread. And what it turned into was uh, sort of fishermen um, teasing each other and harassing each other and sending photos of what they were catching to each other. And, um, uh, and it sort of started this, this dialogue, even though some of the fishermen were fishing uh, way down off of Jonesport in Machias Bay and some of the fishermen were fishing over in Penobscot Bay they had a chance to connect with each other by getting onto this common message thread. 
Um, and it ended up being um, kind of a cool thing for them to uh, uh, connect with each other so that not only were we building relationships with them, but they were building relationships with each other. Um, I think this is immensely important. Um, you know, having an opportunity to sort of take a walk in each other's boots, so to speak. Um, the, uh, this, this is a set of photos that uh, shows you sort of the interchangeability of all of our, all of our different roles and, and how we uh, sort of work together to understand each other's roles. Um, in the first photo, Robin's jigging at about 700 feet of water, I believe, right, Robin? Um, and uh, the grimace on her face uh, says absolutely nothing about her physical ability. Jigging in 700 feet of water is some tough work. And when you do it 20 times in a day, uh, your arm feels like it's going to fall off by the time you hit the wharf. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we'll swap roles while we're, while we're on deck. And it happens kind of organically. Like sometimes the captain will um, come back and help me with, uh, with whatever's going on with the gear on the boat. And he'll tell Robin to go, um, you know, steam the boat for a little while while he comes back and helps me with the gear. Yesterday morning, uh, Robin steamed from just outside Jonesport almost to uh, the Canadian line while Abraham uh, from Jonesport uh, sort of helped me set up the gear on the boat. And what it does is it sort of, it, it gives each of us a, a glimpse into each other's roles and responsibilities so that not only we respect each other a little bit more, uh, but we understand uh, sort of the different components and the different um, uh, mindsets that each other is in. And I think that's really important. Um, one of the things that that does is it builds trust between uh, not only the people that are on the boat, but it builds credibility in, um, in the community that you actually know what you're doing out there. Um, this is a, a kind of a interesting anecdote about purse seining on the ponds. Uh, my colleague and I, Mike Tallhauser, are standing in the skiff in the photo that you see on the right, and we're setting a purse scene for juvenile alewives up in, uh, up in the estuaries. We usually do it at night. We took this particular photo during the day because we wanted to demonstrate to the public how it worked. Um, the first time that we set this purse scene, it did not look this pretty. We, uh, uh, it took us a long time to actually get it right, and um, uh, every time we set it out, we ended up hanging something up on the bow of the boat. And, um, you know, even if we did make a perfect circle, the gear came onto the boat in a mess. And finally we looked at each other and we were like, you know what, we need some help. Um, and what we did was we, we reached out to a commercial pogey saner in Stonington. Uh, his name is Justin Boyce. Some of you might know him. And uh, we joined him for a day. And uh, as soon as we stepped aboard his boat, we knew exactly what was wrong with what we were doing. And um, I, I think sometimes in our own work, we need to, uh, take a step back and admit to ourselves that, you know, maybe we watch some YouTube videos and we think we're experts, uh, but we really need to spend some time with people that do this every day to, to make sure we get it right. And um, uh, we ended up reconfiguring the scene because it turns out when a scientist builds a net that is designed to catch fish, it doesn't work. You have to have it, um, you, you, you probably want a fisherman to build that net if it's, uh, if it's gonna catch some fish. So we ended up reconfiguring the net. We rehung the, the floats that were on the top. We rehung the rings that were on the bottom. We changed out the, uh, the purse line. And two years later, we've got a really solid methodology that we can go back to the community and share with. Um, and, it, and it not only builds trust in the data that you're pumping out, but it, it builds credibility in your program. Um, adaptability and flexibility are pretty huge. Uh, Robin mentioned earlier about uh, some of the changes that, that have happened over the years in the Sentinel survey um, and uh, the addition of the Gilnet um, validation study. Um, you know, when, you, when you're doing the same thing every year for the sake of doing the same thing every year, sometimes you find that um, uh, some of the things that you're doing may not be correct and, and they may not be effective. Um, and um, uh, this is a photo from the sounder on one of the boats. And you can see, uh, let me see if I can make a pointer. Oh, never mind. I lost my menu. Oh, here it is. No, never mind. Um, anyway, you can see sort of the long red uh, squiggles along the bottom of the ocean. This is the sounder that's showing the, the contour of the bottom. Um, and you can see sort of long um, 
uh, squiggles along the bottom. And those are fish. The sort of picked peaks that you see going up and down along the bottom are our jigs. And the funny thing about this photo was we never caught any of those fish. Uh, they were swimming along the bottom and, and we had our jigs uh, pretty much right on top of their heads. Um, we could feel the fish swimming in and amongst our, our line. You could actually feel the fish sort of hitting the line as, as the jigs bounced up and down and they never bit. Um, and it was frustrating the fishermen. It was frustrating me. Robin was even frustrated and she doesn't frustrate easy. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it sort of, it made us go back to the drawing board and, and ask ourselves, you know, are, is the gear that we're using set up correctly for the type of fish that might be on bottom. And one of our theories was that some of these fish might be just too small to, um, uh, to be able to handle or, or be enticed by the gear that we're using. Uh, so that was one of the reasons for building the gillnet validation study is that um, maybe if we can catch different size classes of these fish, we can prove that, um, you know, maybe we just have a, a small population of, of, of fish that are of smaller size. Uh, and maybe they're not susceptible to the gear that we're using. Um, as Robin mentioned, we're, we're about halfway through that study and uh, we may have some results from that in the coming months. Um, this, uh, this idea of ownership, um, and, and I'm not talking about ownership in the sense of privatization, but ownership as in um, uh, the, the stewardship of the people that are involved in the project, having a sense of ownership over the data and a sense of ownership over the process. This, uh, this fellow on the left that you see in this picture is Bailey Bowden. Um, he's from Penobscot and, and very, um, um, very involved in uh, the alewife runs that are in the Bagaduce River. And um, he wanted to build a, uh, uh, a beach scene one year to, to capture some of the data of the juvenile alewives in the, in the Bagaduce River system. And so he, um, he bought a beach scene, he, he modified it a little bit to, uh, to suit our purposes. And we go out and help him um, do these beach scene studies on the Bagaduce every year. Um, and it's a, a really neat experience being with somebody in the community who has a research question that they wanna chase um, and, uh, and sort of helping them through the process of how to create rigor in that um, so that you can actually learn from it. This is another great example of, of uh, sort of having ownership over, over the process and ownership over the, um, uh, the stewardship that you're providing to a, a resource in the community. This is Kathy Limeburner, and uh, she's got a dip net full of alewives there. And, and you can't tell in the photo, but she's running. And she's running across that stream and up to a stocking truck to dump those fish into a stocking truck that's being moved to uh, from Walker's Pond to Frost Pond. Um, there's a really big alewife run in Walker's Pond. Uh, Frost Pond and, and some of the surrounding ponds don't have as strong of a run and some of them didn't have a run at all just a few years ago. And, um, and what we were doing in this photo was tra uh, netting them in, in Walker's, stocking them in Frost so that their young will come back uh, to those systems where they were hatched out. And um, it took us an, an entire afternoon to do it. We were all tired and sweaty and wet by the end of the day. And uh, my colleague, Mike, looked at Kathy and he said, Kathy, thank you so much for, uh, for all your help today. And uh, she didn't use these exact words. She used an expletive, but she said uh, something to the effect of, screw you, those are my fish, thank you. Um, and uh, it kind of made us uh, uh, appreciate the fact that she had some ownership over this resource and, and, uh, and she thought it was important that, um, uh, you know, she was down there doing the work and, and um, it made us realize that she wasn't helping us with our research. We were helping her with hers. Um, so that's, uh, that's an important thing to keep in, in uh, perspective. Uh, on our curiosity, um, Robin mentioned that, uh, you know, we have quite a few fishermen's choice stations that we allow um, uh, fishermen to go, you know, chase their own curiosities. Um, this set of photos is from uh, a day in September last year, I believe it was September 20th, uh, 2019, um, on Matt Trundy's boat. And uh, Matt was very interested in um, finding this spot where his father used to fish uh, about 30 years ago. And um, he got flipping through some of his dad's old, old log books and he found a spot um, out on, uh, out, well, let's call it near the outer fall. Um, 
and um, his father happened to catch a lot of haddock that, that particular year, and he had a really good day on that day, September 20th, about 30 years ago. So we went back on the same exact day in 2019 and sat on the same exact numbers, and lo and behold, we caught some fish. We had the best haddock day we've ever had on the survey um, with as many hooks as we, we fished. We caught hake, we caught pollock, redfish, um, and it was just a a kind of an awesome experience for uh, Matt to fish on the same numbers uh, basically the same time of year as, as his father did 30 years ago and end up getting a response. So um, Matt's an example of one of those fishermen that comes back year after year just because he's just avidly curious about what's out there. Um, and uh, uh, well, the other reason is he, he hates lobstering with a fiery passion and he wants to do anything but so he, he likes to go catch fish and, and uh, we provide him with the gear and the ability to go do that. So he, he, um, he loves to do it. This is another immensely curious person, um, Abraham Beal. We were just out with him yesterday and uh, uh, we had a pretty good day yesterday too. We caught a couple of codfish, a lot of dogfish, uh, which is Robin's favorite fish. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm joking, Robin hates uh, dogfish, especially when we catch hundreds of them. Um, and uh, Abraham always talks about this spot down on Larkins on the, uh, on the Canadian line where his grandfather used to fish. And uh, he's been dying to set hooks out there, um, you know, because he, he heard the stories when he was a kid and uh, he's never been able to fish out there because he doesn't have a ground fish permit. And uh, his halibut license only allows him to fish inside state waters. So it's, it's an itch he's been wanting to scratch for a long time, and we're actually going to scratch that itch next week. Um, we're headed down to uh, fish on some of the same numbers that his grandfather used to fish when he was a kid. So um, I'm excited to see what, what Abraham finds down there. Um, you kind of have to, in this kind of work, you have to have what I call a do-what-it-takes attitude. Um, some of these sentinel trips... Some of the ground fish trips, um, you know, we get up as early as two or three in the morning to get to the boat by 3.30 or four. We're out until about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And then sometimes it's uh, uh, bellied up with an alewife trip that night on the pond uh, where we're on the pond from about eight o'clock until one o'clock in the morning. And uh, it doesn't happen very often, but those kind of back to back early morning, late night, um, 24 hour, uh, work straight through it trips do happen and um, when you have an opportunity to uh, join these fishermen out in the field on days that they have available you take them um, and, uh, and and you don't tell them that you know you're too tired from from the day and let's reschedule for another trip because they might not have another opportunity to to take time out of their day to go with you so um, you you kind of have to have a do what it takes attitude to to get through it Um, let's see. Oh, visibility. Um, visibility, I think is really important. Um, and, and in the last year, if you followed our, our social media pages, we're on, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. I think we have a Twitter account, although I don't know how to use Twitter. So I don't, I don't see anything that's on there. But, um, if you, if you are following us on social media, you'll see posts, uh, from our research trips, you'll see posts from, uh, different things that we're doing. And uh, that's really ramped up in the past couple of years. And I think it's been a really awesome way for us to connect with the community and let them know what we're doing. Uh, this picture in the middle of the screen is from yesterday morning down in Jonesport. It was a beautiful day on the water yesterday. Um, one of our board members likes to say that doing research without communicating your results is just a hobby. And um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And uh, that's why we try to um, have presentations at the Maine Fishermen's Forum. Um, we, uh, um, you know, we, we try to get, get our stuff out there on social media as much as we can and uh, try to let the community know what we're up to. The photo on the right is um, uh, another colleague of mine, Tom Dime, and he's helping me bait hooks out in the parking lot. Um, and what we do is we set up a, a blue canopy over us um, to protect the bait from the sun because we don't want it to thaw out. And an interesting thing happens, and, and that is that fishermen drive by and they see the blue canopy and they know what we're doing, and they always stop in and they, and they you know, chat our ears off, uh, sometimes to the point where all our bait thaws out and uh, half of it gets ruined. But um, 
they uh, they want to know what we're up to. And, you know, maybe they heard that we were out with Matt Trundy the other day and they wanted to know how we did. Or they're wondering where those t those particular tub trawls are going. And we tell them and they, you know, they get out of the truck and they grab a chart and, and point out some of the hot spots that they used to fish on when they were um, when they were ground fishing. And it's a it's a really neat way for us to connect with the community and and um, and have that um, uh, sort of um, extra set of eyeballs and extra set of opinions. And when you do that, um, when you get that word out there in the community, it's, um, it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, the guy in the middle um, is uh, Jacob Knowles, and he, uh, he's not involved in the Sentinel work. Um, he's been involved in, in past projects that we've had before. Um, but whenever he catches codfish, he makes sure to send me a picture of him because he knows that we, um, that we have this project. And, and um, uh, he, he likes to keep us informed on what's going on in his neck of the woods. Um, the chart on the left uh, is also uh, uh, kind of a neat one. It shows a couple of our longline sites and um, a past ground fish fisherman um, gave me a stack of log books that he wanted me to um, plot his numbers from years and years ago from back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, he wanted to know where our stations overlap with some of the places that he fished. And uh, these two particular sites, the two blue squares that you see were assigned to my brother, Matt. Um, and so we fished on these two sites and then we jumped over and we fished on a couple of marks from these old log books and we ended up catching a staving halibut, um, one of the biggest uh, halibut my brother's seen. So, um, so that was a pretty cool experience too. And then the picture on the right is a, uh, a friend of uh, Josh Dimes um, and uh, she just rode along with us for the day because Josh talks her ear off about the survey all the time and she wanted to see what it was all about. So. That's her launching a high flyer off the side there. All right, I saved this one for last because some of you might think this is a little corny, but I think it's actually really important. Um, sharing a meal together is, is, is kind of a neat way to, to get some extra connection. Um, and that might sound a little uh, strange, but hear me out. Um, I went to the dump one day and I was backed up to the metal pile and I was throwing a couple of brake discs onto the metal pile and I found this grill. And I lugged it home, proud as a peacock, to show my wife. And she said, oh, now you have a grill to take on all your fishing trips. And I said, you are a genius. So this red grill has followed us uh, on almost every Sentinel trip so far for the past uh, couple of years. And we make eggs in the morning, biscuits, sausage, um, steak tips, scallops, halibut. Um, all kinds of awesome food. We, I always joke around that we might not catch anything, but we'll definitely eat good and we will have a good time. Um, and uh, even though it's not necessarily the most COVID friendly thing, there's something about standing around a skillet and eating some steak tips with your colleagues and, and partners and fishermen that um, uh, sort of increases the connection between all of you. And I think that's, um, I think that's a pretty important element too. The goal of all of this is, is to sort of create a, a solid network between all of the different people that participate in it. I don't know if you can see the blue lines on there, but um, I couldn't even fit all the fishermen's photos on here. I think we have 10 fishermen, is that right? 10 fishermen participating this year. And um, that's the, as many, that's more fishermen than we've ever had on the project. Um, and, um, and more scientific partners than we've ever had on the project too. And the ultimate goal here is to create this sort of network of scientists and fishermen and policymakers to Im increase the impact of our research efforts. And, um, and all of the things that I described in the, in the few slides above this and the things that Robin's described in her presentation, I think have really built this as a, a, a really robust platform for research and, and has really um, uh, gotten our work out, out there into the community, into the scientific community. So um, let's see. Oh, there's one more. This is really just to tease you. Um, we get to experience some phenomenal sunrises while we're out there um, and some sunsets too. I think actually on this particular trip, we saw the sun come up and we saw it go back down. Um, so um, we, uh, we get up early, we hit it hard and um, we have a good time and, and we collect some really in, important information that is hopefully someday gonna help the, um, the fishery as a whole. 
I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who I think is monitoring some questions. And yeah, I'll thanks, Pat and Robin. That, that was great. Um, and so we have plenty of time here for some questions from you all. You could raise your hand, and I'm monitoring the um, participant list. We have about 20 attendees. And, uh, or you can type a question into the chat box if you like. Um, and there's also a Q&A function, but we'll use the chat box. Um, so if you have any questions for either Robin or Pat, please throw them our way. I'll start with one for Robin. So Robin, um, ha what, what has surprised you most about this experience that, that you're having? You know, the various things that Pat just described. Yeah, so I mean, as far as, you know, like interactions and relationships with fishermen, um, I've, I've worked doing a lot of different things involving, you know, fishermen and surveys. I worked as a fisheries observer in Alaska, which was like living on boats with fishermen. There's something so different and unique about this project. And I, it's hard to put my finger on it, but it's, I don't want to say it's like about the grill because it's not, but there's just like the type of environment that this survey has created. Like, again, we work hard, we do, but like we also joke around. So it doesn't become this like the fisherman is the driver of the boat and like we are here to get science and like have no fun. I don't know. It's, it's just a really incredible thing to be a part of. Um, and it is so fun to see fishermen like excited and curious about what we're pulling up on our gear um you know there are going to be days where we don't catch very much and it's kind of like a downer but then there are just as many days where just to like see them like light up you're like oh my gosh <laughs> we're like they're enjoying this and like we're getting we're it's like mutually we're getting things out of it different things but um yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to describe, but it's it's certainly a, a different type of survey and, and interactions and collaborations with fishermen than I've ever experienced before. And I kind of doubt that there are many like this. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have a question from uh, Robert Ferraro for, for both of you or either of you. And, and um, so any sense about whether the alewife increase in the bagadoos has increased the number of cod or other predators? Uh, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, well, the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of, um, we've got a lot of data in the pipeline that's hopefully gonna tell us that information within the next couple of years. We've done, um, as Robin described, we've taken uh, stomach samples and muscle tissue samples for quite a few years now um, and uh, Simon Thurl down at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is uh, in the process of analyzing those right now. He has run all the samples that we've taken for the past eight years and, um, and is in the process of, of putting some results together for us. What we know, uh, we, we don't know too much so far about that, uh, but what I can say is, um, is that we, um, we, have, we have some more work to do. Um, we catch a lot of juvenile fish on our survey. We catch a lot of juvenile codfish on our survey. And, um, and I think because of that, we, we suffer a little bit from, uh, from not being able to catch some of those older fish of, of reproductive size. Uh, what we know about codfish is that um, they, their diet switches when they reach reproductive maturity. Um, when they're younger, they feed on things like crustaceans and uh, you know, crabs and lobsters and things that are um, uh, easier for them to get a hold of. When they reach reproductive maturity, their diet actually switches to a more lipid rich prey. So um, the fact that we don't catch the older fish um, tells us a couple of things. It tells us that maybe our timing is a little bit off. And it also tells us that we need to be targeting these older fish when they're in shore so that we can get the information that we need to link them to things like herring, alewives, um, uh, those things that they're, that they're actually targeting when they're older. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I would say stay tuned in the next few months for uh, hopefully some results about that. Okay, thanks Pat. 
Thanks for your question, Robert. Um, any other questions out there? I don't see any hands up. You can raise your hand and I can let you ask our panelists or, um, or you can type in a question. While you're thinking about that, I'll remind you that as an attendee, you'll get an, an email from us thanking you for attending and an opportunity to uh, complete a quick survey that helps us to um, improve on this approach and give us ideas for next year's session. We do have one more plan for this fall. Uh, it'll be on October 30th and Dr. Carla Gunther um, is going to lead uh, a discussion about our ecosystem-based fisheries management initiative, which we have called the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Collaborative. We'll be sending more information out about that soon. Here's a question from Janet Griffin. Thank you, Janet. Um, she wants to know how has the COVID pandemic impacted our work this season? Um, yes and no. Um, uh, yes, in, in the sense that uh, usually we all get together at the beginning of the season to, to sort of plan out this work and, and we like to do it in person. We also get together at the end of the season to sort of have a big celebration and, and um, uh, communicate our results back to the fishermen and uh, the different partners and things involved. Um, that part of it, it has impacted um, the, the sampling season. It, it hasn't impacted only because there are so few people on the boat and the boats are so big. Um, there's only three of us on the boat at any one time, um, and, um, and, and we're the only three people that we ever see anyway. So <laughs> um, that way it, it, it hasn't. Um, I don't know if you can think of other ways, Robin or Paul. That Well, I do recall, Robin, you might comment that the, your vice president for research at the university had to implement a protocol to help make sure students like you were safe. And so your professor, Yong Chen, um, had to you know, get approval really for you to participate, right? Yeah, so I mean, there was certainly a question of whether I would be allowed to go out and, and survey, whether I would be allowed to, you know, granted travel. Um, and and yeah, it was, it was a little touch and go there for a while because for a long time they really weren't approving anything at all. Um, but, you know, with the fact again that, you know, if we need to, we can make it be totally minimal staff. Um, um, luckily we did end up getting, getting approved. I was concerned at the beginning of the year that like our, our ability to go out and sample would be impacted because, you know, some parents are now home with their kids more than they were before. And, you know, obviously the lobstering was a mess. <laughs> so in theory, there, there were a lot more people available towards the beginning, but I think that there's a lot more pressure on them now to kind of do a lot more fishing. So it, it is kind of hard, this balance of like when they're more available and when they're not. And I think that COVID has more indirectly impacted like how available fishermen are that maybe we can't really determine necessarily. But overall, I mean, it didn't really impact. I think we had like maybe one fisherman drop out just, you know, because of semi COVID related issues. Um, just concerning, you know, wanting to make a little extra money or whatever. But um, yeah, luckily, I would say overall, it hasn't really seemed to make a big difference compared to last year. Okay, thanks. Um, Barbara Kent Lawrence has a question and I'm gonna try to let her ask it herself. Barbara, would you, would you like to ask your question yourself? Go ahead sure. Um, I'm wondering if you're seeing any differences already in the findings between collaborative research and traditional research? Because I think it, that would be really interesting. I can take a stab at that one. Um, I mean, at, at the moment, I, I don't think, I, I'm currently trying to run some analyses kind of comparing different data sets. Um, so like the Sentinel survey to say the DMR inshore trawl survey and the NOAA survey, um, less through the lens of the impact of collaboration and more just in kind of the fact that these different surveys are either operating in different areas or, you know, even the DMR inshore trawl survey, there are places that you just can't get a trawl because of, the, of all of the lobster gear, which is actually why the Sentinel survey was developed in the first place was to try to kind of fill in some of those gaps. So. 
I'm looking at differences kind of in that respect, but um, hadn't really thought about looking at, you know, collaboration as like maybe an, an impact factor. Um, I don't know if, if you guys at MCCF have know of any, you know, studies or even just like anecdotal comparisons. Can I tell you the, the reason behind my question, uh, which is that there has been uh, sometimes distrust on both sides, and that's one of the issues that you're bridging, which I think is wonderful. Um, but I'm just wondering if having the participation of fishermen gives them a chance to show that there are there is great availability, greater abundance than than sci that the more science, the more traditional um, research might have shown in the past. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, Pat, maybe you can weigh on, in on this too. I would say, because it, it, it certainly especially comes up with things like cod and that obviously, you know, the scientific community is like, there are no cod. Right. And I would say probably the vast majority of fishermen don't quite hold that view. Um, they always joke with me every time we catch a cod that like I'm killing the last cod in the Gulf of Maine <laughs> when I take samples from it. Um, I will say sometimes they're, they are surprised that we don't catch cod in places where it seems like we really should or places that historically have caught a lot of cod, even with the gill nets. So sometimes it's, it's almost more, and again, that's not necessarily saying that there absolutely weren't cod there, but I think I see more of fishermen being like, oh, there weren't cod there than being like, see, I told you all the cod were, were here. I feel like that's a little bit more common. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we have days where we bring in a bunch of cod at one station and it's like, this looks pretty great for cod. <laughs> Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, no, no, it does, and I, I don't think it's at this point probably an answerable question. I just think it's one that it would be great if it were in the back of your minds as a way of establishing a mutually credible um, gauge of what is available. Yeah, Th thank you, Barbara, and I, I'll just follow up on that by saying that I think it's extremely important that fishermen are involved right from from the beginning and then through the end. Um, of the project so that not only are their insights uh, driving the research questions, but they are the ones collecting the information and they're also the ones interpreting the results so that when we come back to them with results that we've come up with, um, they have a chance to add some nuance to that. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's a, a really important difference between collaborative research and, and some other types of research that exist out there. Thank you for that question, Barbara. Appreciate that. Um, it's a it's a very important one too, and, and we we're being very intentional with this project, and as well as the Alive project, working with some of our science advisors in the coming year to to poke at this and make sure that as we as we practice collaborative approaches to our research and management, that we're um, we're doing it as well as possible and meeting you know scientific standards, but also benefiting from these uh, touches that, that Pat's described so well for you. I'll just share a quick comment from a colleague of ours from NOAA, Dr. John Hoey, who directs the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, is with us today. And he just expresses great presentations. Thanks for clearly articulating the benefit of building close relationships with fishermen to answer common questions, along with stuff we haven't always recognized. Uh, thanks, John, for that comment. and appreciate you being here today. Um, we have one. One more question in queue, and we still have some more time if anybody else wants to type in or raise your hand. Uh, oh, I see Richard. Hold on a sec, Richard. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk. Richard Nelson, nice to have you here. Hi, you hearing me? Yep. Yep. Um, I'd just like to say with that, that last part that I, I look back, I'm a retired retired fisherman, and, and I look back as, as my experiences with, with the collaborative science and then moving from that on, onto the, the education series at GMRI and working with Island Institute and things. That, that beginning of that, that science things gave me a certain amount of courage and, and sort of opened up my sort of this closed social environment of being a fisherman. 
and, and it just opened that up and, and I, I I call it my my coming out as such as a, which is kind of a you know a, a ah, joke there but but you know it can give that courage to fishermen to to, to speak their mind to 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 have an opinion, have opinion on, on the climate and what's going on in, in the environment. And, you know, it's just, I, I went on to, to, you know, be uh, kind of a spokesman and, and write about climate things and, and work on, um, on ocean planning and, and visit Washington and, and just represent this whole thing. And, and I just, uh, just, I, I'm not bragging on myself. I, I'm just trying to point to, that those beginnings of that that spark of doing those things came from this kind of activity, and and I think I'm I'm all for it and encourage it. Thanks, Richard. I think uh, Richard, you and my grandfather are the only two people that I know of that actually successfully retired from fishing. But he went and played golf in Florida instead. <laughs> <laughs> We wow. have one question from in thanks Richard appreciate that uh, Chelsea is asking is there anything unusual you've caught on a recent sentinel trip that has caught you by surprise this wasn't recent but we caught a tile fish back in 2000 uh, what year did the Gulf Stream take that big swing in shore was it 2015 we caught a tile fish on one of the long lines that's crazy. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> also really weird. Yeah, yeah, that, that has not happened in the past two years. Um, we get some really interesting things coming up in, in the gill net sometimes, you know, things that you wouldn't otherwise normally see on our um, normal jigging gear, whether that's like monkfish. Um, we caught a shark once, which was pretty crazy. Um, I think it ended up being what I decided was a poor beagle. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, because usually we get like kind of the usual suspects, you know, on, on the jig. It's like pollock and mackerel and cod and um, then mostly dogfish <laughs> on the long line. Um, but uh, yeah, every once in a while, something kind of cool comes up. Yeah, I think uh, one of the more, more surprising things for me to see over the years is the number of legal size halibut that we catch on our on our tiny 12 aught hooks. Uh, the commercial fishery executes a, um, a 16 aught circle hook for halibut and we catch them on our 12 aught circle hooks which are considerably smaller. I think that's been pretty cool to see, you know, big legal size halibut come up on our hooks and I think it demonstrates the, the health of that fishery as well. Great. Well, um, we've come to the end of our hour. I wanna thank all the attendees for, for being there and thanks Pat and Robin for great presentations. Uh, you can see on the slide in front of you ways that you can uh, stay in touch with us through, um, through social media and on our website, lots more information. We do have one more of these Lunch and Learns scheduled for, um, for October 30th. Um, and that will be Dr. Carla Gunther um, talking about the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Collaborative that we're uh, helping to coordinate. Um, you will receive a, a survey. Please fill it out um, by email and um, send us your thoughts about future presentations. And I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe and comfortable. Thank you for being there. Thanks everyone. Thank you, have a good day.